Our Heavenly Father, you've heard our prayer. And we ask that you would respond by placing us safely in the arms of Jesus. Tonight's message, Lord, is one that you never wanted to be preached. It was not a part of your design for it to ever take place. And now history is about to repeat itself, not with water, but with fire. And I pray that we would really see where we are and that we would follow and heed your counsel. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that is so humble to come into this worship service with us. There are some people who feel too good to come into worship services. But you, the God of heaven, are visiting us night after night, and I thank you, Lord. Now bless your word. Please, Lord, in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Bible says in the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, beginning with verse 9, Ecclesiastes 1, beginning with verse 9, the thing that hath been, it is that which shall be. And that which is done is that which shall be done. And there is no new thing under the sun. And that's a very important passage of Scripture, especially when it comes to the experience of those who live on this earth. God's children have always acted the exact same way ever since the fall of man. As a matter of fact, we read in Hosea, turn with me there, we read in Hosea, Hosea chapter 7, the problem that Ephraim had. And we want to never be become so confused that when we look in Scripture and we see a name like Ephraim that we really believe that this applies to Ephraim. We serve a God that is so wise that He could have literally placed each one of our names in this Bible every time you open it. God is so powerful that when you open the Bible, everyone could own a Bible, they could print Ephraim, and every time you look at it, you could see your name there. And you should see your name there. Because these words are given not because God wants to frighten us, but because God wants to save us. And brothers and sisters, it's interesting, the more I look at what took place with the antediluvians, those are the ones who lived before the flood, I see us repeating the same thing today. Notice what the Bible says in Hosea 7. Remember, there's no new thing under the sun. We're doing the same thing that they have done. Notice what it says about Ephraim, beginning with verse 8. It says, Ephraim, he hath mixed himself among the people. Ephraim is a cake not turned. Strangers have devoured his strength, and he knoweth it not. Yea, gray hairs are here and there upon him, yet he knoweth it not. In other words, he started mixing with people who were not spiritual. And it's dangerous to be around people that are not headed in the same direction as you are unless you're trying to be a vessel to teach them about God. You cannot have fellowship with the world. It's impossible. And it's disturbing to me, brothers and sisters, when I see so many worldly people who don't claim, who, who claim Christianity, but blatantly make millions of dollars off worldly entities, and yet they're satisfied and comfortable about people who claim to be Christians, especially in the music industry. In the music industry, we see everyone claiming to be Christians. I, I see uh, stars who sing about the most vile things, and the minute they get a reward, they get up on stage and say, I want to praise God for what He has allowed me to do. God didn't allow them to do that. 
but they feel comfortable because the Christian world loves them, the Christian world is supporting them, and so many people are saying, it's okay, you can do it. I remember finding that a good friend of mine in Los Angeles who I hadn't seen in years, I mean years, since maybe the fourth grade, I found out that he owned a nightclub, a very popular nightclub, and I, I, I saw his brother one night and I thought it was him and I followed him till he pulled over. And he said, oh no, he owns this nightclub now. I said, you mean this nightclub? He said, yes, it's a very popular nightclub in Los Angeles. I said, is he there now? He said, yes. I said, let me go see him. I was a minister. I wanted to go witness to him. And I went and I told him and immediately he said, let him in. And I went in and I sat down and he came and after we embraced and I said, man, I told him what I was doing. He said, great, I'm a Christian too. I said, well, why do you own this if you're a Christian? He said, well, I've talked to my preacher about it, and my pastor said that God understands because this is the way I'm making my living right now, but if I continue to be faithful, that God will bless me to do something different later. I said, your minister has lied to you. God does not understand. God expects you to shut this place down, not even to sell it to anybody, to, to influence someone else in the darkness of Satan's ability to hold on to and embrace lies. But people are believing that we can ride both sides of the fence, and God in his mercy is constantly trying to pull us back to him. Notice what the Bible says in Psalm 81. In Psalm 81, God never wanted to destroy his people. He is not excited over destroying this earth. The earth is so corrupt. I was riding today with, with, with Mom Ford, and I, was, and, and I said, isn't it interesting how it's so beautiful, and yet all oh, this is death. And she said, yes, we look at the fall when leaves are falling off the trees, and we say, look at how beautiful it is. We even look at death and think it's beautiful. This earth has nothing appetizing on it to God except you. You're the only thing that he's interested in, and too often we are not interested in him. And notice what it says in, in Psalm 81, beginning with verse 9. It says, There shall no strange God be in thee, neither shalt thou worship any strange God. I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide, and I will fill it. You don't have to try to fill your life with a bunch of emptiness. God says, listen, if you wait on me, I'll fill it, and it won't be a void. And when God fills you, brothers and sisters, it's complete. It's a peace that comes with it. Notice what he goes on to say, but my people, what? Would not hearken to my voice, and Israel would none of me. So I gave them up unto their own hearts, lust, and they walked in their own counsels. You see, God pleads and pleads and pleads with man, and when man refuses to follow, then God reluctantly gives you up. It's because God sees that there's nothing that heaven can do to get your attention. So when we look in Genesis and we talk about the seven reasons why, six plus one, why the antediluvians didn't get on board the ark, what you're going to see is man outwitting God. Man becoming so intelligent that the God of heaven cannot orchestrate anything else to save him. And just like Ephraim started mixing with the people, when the antediluvians started mixing with the world, that's when God said, I must destroy them. Turn with me to Genesis and notice what the Bible says. In Genesis chapter 6, notice what the Bible says. It's interesting, but we take very lightly the word of God. If we would simply ask God to guide us by this book, we would have a lot less problems in life, brothers and sisters. Notice what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. And if you're there, let me hear you say amen. amen. And it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and the daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair. And they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be a hundred and twenty years. There were giants in the earth in those days. And also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. 
and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made man. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And we need to praise God today for Christians. If it were not for people praying, this world would destruct, would self-destruct. Because of the lives of a few people, many are being able to be blessed. Noah, one man, God looked at Noah, and Noah found grace. Grace did not come in the New Testament, brothers and sisters. There has always been grace. There was grace put in place immediately when Adam bit the fruit. Jesus shielded Adam from being destroyed. He said, listen, wait a minute, I'll take his place. Or Adam would have been destroyed instantly, brothers and sisters. It was a proleptic sacrifice, a sacrifice on credit, the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. Grace has always been in place. As a matter of fact, before man even sinned, there was a plan to save him if he should sin. God would have been an irresponsible God if he didn't have a plan, if he waited to call a meeting afterwards and said, uh-oh, what are we going to do? No, God set this sanctuary service, this whole plan of salvation, he set it in action before man ever made a mistake. And even though it was in in place, man still did not have to go against God. And here God says that he found a man that found grace. Noah found grace in the sight of God. But remember, the things that happened before are the same things that happen today. What happened that caused God to say that man is about to be so wicked that my spirit is not always going to be with him? The whirlings started marrying the people in the church. The Canaanites started marrying, the, I mean, not the Canaanites, but the, the children of Cain started marrying the children of God. And they didn't see a big deal. What's the difference marrying out of my religion? What's the difference if I'm a Christian and, and he's not? He's nice to me. You know, there's nicer boys in the world than in the church. And we rationalize. And too often the devil tricks my sisters into believing that you have to go outside of Christ to find a spouse. One of the reasons why many women don't have men today is because God, if he gave you that man, you would put him before God. And God doesn't want you to worship someone above him. But many people believe that when God said that the sons of God and, and, and the daughters of men, when they got together, they say that it was angels that came together with humans. No, brothers and sisters, angels are not interested in having intimate sexual affairs with humans. When God said the sons of men, he was, talking about, he was talking about his children. As a matter of fact, go with me to the book of Exodus. And notice, let me clarify that point, because there are many churches, Exodus chapter 4, there are many churches that believe that when God said that the sons of men came together with the, with the with, I mean the sons of God came with the daughters of men, that they believe that angels had intimate relationships with humans. And this is why there were giants in the land. No, brothers and sisters, they were giants in intellect. Man was much taller than us then. Notice what the Bible says when it refers to the sons of man. Angels aren't interested in doing what we do. Now, demonic forces do get involved, and they place all types of corrupt things and vile things in our minds. And you know, young people, one of the biggest tricks that the devil is getting people to do now some people will look down on homosexuality because it is an abomination before God. There's no way we can excuse it. I was born like that? Well, if you were born genetically inclined to want a man, all you have to do is call on the same God of heaven and he'll change those genetics. Amen. Maybe your grandfather was gay and maybe your father was and maybe your great-grandfather was and nobody knew about it. And all of a sudden you come with those tendencies. Yes, I believe that genes are transferred, but God has the power to give you victory over cultivated as well as hereditary tendencies. He has the power to give us victory over everything, brothers and sisters. So we look at two men together and we say, oh, how horrible, and it is horrible. We look at two women together and we say, oh, how horrible, and it is horrible. We look at a man and a woman together that aren't married, and it is horrible. But what about the great sin of masturbation? The Lord told me to say this. Let me tell you something. There are magazines on racks that are not labeled X-rated, and millions of children are engaging, and people are being told that telling our little kids that it's healthy in the world. 
Some say, oh, how can he talk about this? You better talk about it to your children because demons are having your children fondling and playing and getting caught up in what we term as self-abuse. And it's no different from homosexuality. And it's sick, brothers and sisters. And it causes blindness and back trouble and, and eye trouble. How do I know? A prophet told me. A prophet lists over 50 things that this does. And it's the most popular thing going now. It's what people are telling, doctors are telling children that it's safe sex. Safe sex is being loyal to God and abstaining, brothers and sisters. That's the only safe way to do it. And demons are playing with the, with, with the organs of men and women. We are living in a sick society. But it's real when these different people give you articles and magazines that you can buy off of regular racks, brothers and sisters. Regular store racks. This isn't something that's in the X-rated zone. Your child can pick up anything and just open up a regular magazine. Now, I won't call the name of it because I'm not going to promote filth. But right in the grocery line, you can pick it up and you can read filth. And your child, thinking it's innocent, will find themselves captivated by demons. And everywhere I've ever done youth crusades, hundreds of young people, not 10 and 20, hundreds come and say, oh, my God, I am trapped. I didn't know. We must educate our children at home with the Word of God. We must teach them, don't be afraid to teach your children the holiness of God and what is safe and what is not, because if you let the world teach them, it'll be too late. They'll teach them lies, brothers and sisters. But angels are not involved. Demonic forces will get you to do things that are horrible in the sight of God. Amen. Notice what the Bible says in Exodus chapter 4. Exodus 4, beginning with verse 22, the Bible says, And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is who? My son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. So when the Bible talks about the sons of God, he's talking about the children of God. As a matter of fact, go with me to the book of Romans chapter 8. Brothers and sisters, we're living in a sick world, and you can't be a son of God and a son of the world at the same time. We have to choose right now, this day, who we will serve, and we have to continue to make the choice, brothers and sisters. We can't choose today and say, oh, I'm saved today, and I'll be saved forever. One night I need to touch on that subject. Some people think that all you have to do is give your heart to God and then live as you want to live. There are many texts in the Bible that, 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 that dispute this thought. The devil wants you to believe that. The Bible says in Romans chapter 8, Romans what chapter are we in? Romans chapter 8, beginning with verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are what? The sons of God. So when God says the sons of God, he's talking about those who are living for them, those who have given him his heart. As a matter of fact, notice what the Bible says about angels in Matthew chapter 22. Angels aren't thinking the way we think. Angels aren't trying to fondle with people. That's the devil degrading the holiness of angelic beings. Notice what the Bible says in Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22, and if you're there, let me hear you say amen. amen. Matthew chapter 22, Heavenly Father, I beg you to open every mind, every heart to the assaults of the enemy so that we will know which way to go. We need your Holy Spirit tonight. We need your spirit to move in such a way that we can become so engulfed in the victory of Jesus so that we do not ever turn back or desire the things of this world. Change our carnal hearts and minds. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. This thing is serious, brothers and sisters. Sometimes as I'm speaking, the thought will come, somebody saying no for the final time to God. Every single night, somebody has said no today. Somebody has gone too far. Probation is closing on this world, and it's closing on individuals, and every single moment God is appealing. Do you know that every single moment there's a war for our thoughts? Never is there a time that the devil is taking a break, nor is God taking a break. But too often we frustrate heaven. Angels leave earth, and they look back weeping, saying, don't they want to go home? Don't they want to go home? Why do they want this earth? Nothing in this world, when we look at it, will last. Nothing, brothers and sisters. I don't care how good these cameras are. In a year from now, they won't be any good anymore. They'll, they'll need to update them. The things of this world get old. 
No matter what kind of car you have, in a couple of years, you'll want another one because they'll get old. Look at how advanced computers have become. This world is getting old, brothers and sisters, and we need to go to a land where it won't be any decay, where it won't be any aging, where it won't be any sorrow, where it won't be any pain, where you're not stripped away at night from your loving children and awakened by the phone with someone telling you something tragic. Amen. Why don't they want to come home? Angels are working for us, brothers and sisters. And our minds are too captivated by the things that will not last, things that will be destroyed. And we must ask God constantly, Lord, quicken my spirit. Arouse me to the reality of the times I live in. I must bear the presence of God where I go. Why? Because I may come in contact with one who is about to say no. I was told a story today, and I didn't plan to tell this, Lady told me, she said, listen, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was, I was traveling somewhere with some, some friends and we were looking at these big stuffed raccoons. And she said, I decided to buy one of these raccoons, but I didn't know why. She said, I felt the Spirit of God telling me to buy it. And, 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 and the price was high and, and I kept wanting it because I raised raccoons when I was young. And she went on to say, finally, we went on and bought it. I don't know why God told me to buy it. And she says she got home that night and then she had a program to do at the church and on her way out the door, the Lord said, take the raccoon with you. What? Take the raccoon to church? A stuffed animal to church? That doesn't make any sense, Lord. But the presence of God was speaking to her and her mind was open to listen to God. So she took the raccoon to church. And I can imagine people looking, I would have looked. I would have looked at her like, what is this woman about to do? When it was time for her to get up, she got up and she didn't know what was going on. She said, Lord, I feel, I feel very stupid, but I'm going to do it. You told me to do it. And she put it up on the stage and then all of a sudden she kind of started weeping. It said people kind of opened up, their hearts warmed up. But at the end of her talk, one lady pulled her to the side and said, listen, I need to tell you something. She said, I'm a new believer. And I was giving up on this God thing. I had asked the Lord to show me some things and he wouldn't. So one day on the way to work, I said, Lord, if you're real, if this God thing is true, show me a deer. And she said, I saw deers all day long. She said, but when I got home, I, I realized I always see deers. <clears throat> That's no big thing. I see deers all the time. And so my friend was calling me and they said, listen, you need to come. You need to come and see what's going on. It's, it's a television broadcast and they're coming to give some testimonies. Just come. And she said, okay, I'll come. And then that day as she headed out to work, she said, Lord, okay, please, I'm going to try this again, Lord. If you're real, show me a raccoon. She said, all day she didn't see a raccoon. And so she called her friend and said, look, I'm not going with you. In her mind, God is not real, but her friend was persistent. Come, please come, please come, please come. And finally she did come. And the day that she asked God for that, what did she see? A raccoon. We don't understand. And I told, I told, I told my sister that God allowed you to be attracted to raccoons as a child just for that particular instance. And many of us, brothers and sisters, have had individual experiences and only your experience can reach somebody. And some of us won't even invite people to come to the meetings. Some of us will walk to the grocery store clerk and we won't say a word when you're the only personality that can win them. We need to be winning souls because every soul we come in contact with could be saying no for the final time to God. We must stop looking at individuals as though we're going to see them tomorrow. How often do we believe? I remember when I was pastoring in a certain city. There was a real small city next to it. And this man kissed his little girl and said goodnight to his little, I mean, said goodbye. I'm going to take mommy to work and I'll be back to take you to school where well, her boyfriend had come by. And she was trying to break it off with this boy, but he was a very persistent little boy. And, and, and he kept forcing himself and the father came back to pick her up and found the boy trying to bother this little girl of his. And in a rage, he started attacking this boy and he turned around and shot the father dead put the girl in the trunk, started driving around the city, parked her in a barn, went home and ate a sandwich. This is sickening. Saw a neighbor of his who was a taxi cab driver and said, can I catch a ride? He said, sure, come on, you don't have to pay. I won't cut the meter on. Then he shot and killed him and then drove around in the taxi waiting for a call to try to rape another girl. We don't know when it's the last time that we'll see an individual, brothers and sisters. We say goodbye to our children as though tomorrow is promised, as though they're coming home. We leave our homes as though we're coming back. Just because this crusade is planned to go a certain distance doesn't mean I'll be around to preach it. 
We can't take that for granted. God doesn't need me. God can use anybody more effectively than he chooses, brothers and sisters. And we need to wake up that you are actually engaging in the presence of people who are saying no for the final time to God. No for the final time to God. Let me finish on so we could finish up here. Notice what the Bible says about angels. Matthew 22. Matthew 22, beginning with verse 30, the Bible, I mean, beginning with verse 28, the Bible says, Therefore in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered and said unto them, Ye do err, not knowing the Scriptures, nor the power of God. For in the resurrection they neither marry, nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels of God in what? In heaven. The angels of God in heaven. There's no marriage. There's no given in marriage. Angels aren't thinking of this. As a matter of fact, brothers and sisters, God gave firm, strong warnings to his people against intermarrying. And young people, I'm telling you right now, and older people, if you are involved in a relationship with someone that does not believe the word of God like you, you need to break that off. Can two walk together lest they be agreed, the Bible says. How can you, who have a certain belief system, want to marry somebody who believes totally different. Then they, they, the devil will cause them to be sweet now. But once you say, I do, those demons will arouse themselves into a warfare in your home that you never dreamed of. You could be miserable by yourself. Notice what the Bible says in Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy, what chapter are we going to? Seven. Chapter 7. Notice what the Bible says. And, 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 and I'm telling you, young people, I'm telling you, young people, and I'm speaking to the older people too, you need to really stop this intermarrying. If a man doesn't love God, he can never love you. If a man doesn't love the one who allows him to get up in the morning and breathe, how can he ever love you? You can't match what God does for him. Notice what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 7, beginning with verse 3. The Bible says in Deuteronomy 7, beginning with verse 3, Neither shalt thou make marriages with them. Thy daughters thou shalt not give unto his son, nor his daughter, unto, uh, nor, his, nor his daughter shall, take, uh, shall thou take unto thy son. For they will what? For they will turn away Thy, thy son from following me, that they may serve other gods, so will the anger of the Lord be kindled against you and destroy thee suddenly. God says, listen, if you do this, they're going to turn you away. Don't, how many marriages, if they were able to witness tonight, would stand up and say, young people, I really believe that I could change him. I really believed I could change her. It doesn't happen. It does not happen at all. And Sunday night when we deal with family night, you need to bring all your family members. If your home is hurting, you're going to see Bible principles and Bible truths that's going to, hurt, that's going to help the, the worst marriage. And it's going to enhance the marriages that are good. And those who are single, you're going to see from the Bible how you should start looking for a mate and what true courtship really is. We need to know from God's Word because let me tell you something, the world is perverting it and it's giving you a glamorized vision of what is not true. Let me give you one more text about this mixed marriage. Go with me to the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 13. Notice what the Bible says in Nehemiah chapter 13. Brothers and sisters, it's a dangerous thing, but the devil is accomplishing the same thing that he accomplished in days of old. Remember, there's nothing new under the sun. You see, if he can get us to mix marriages and he can get us caught up marrying people in the world, our children are the ones that will really bring in the apostasy. You see, how, how can I leave my children with an unconverted grandparent? And the grandparent wants to see their grandchildren, but the grandparent doesn't think as serious as I do about showing certain television programs. She thinks that some cartoons are just cute cartoons, and oh, come on, they're a little too strict. So they agree with you when you're there, but then they say, look, daddy's a little too strict. Here, have a little ice cream. It won't really hurt you. Ham isn't that bad for you, and you may be raising your child to be a vegetarian. Or you may be raising your child with certain principles, and, and, but, but they don't believe like you, and they think that your worship is fanatical. And this is what happened before. Notice what it says in Nehemiah chapter 13. Nehemiah chapter 13, beginning with verse 23. Notice what happened when Ezra and Nehemiah wanted to go and rebuild and restore the principles of God amongst the Jews. In those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod and Ammon 
and of Moab, and their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them, and cursed them, and smote certain of them, and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. So here God says, listen, we need to be careful. Why? Can you imagine going to preach the word of God and your children don't understand it anymore? One of the most frustrating things in the world is to stand up and speak a certain way and all the people who should know what you're talking about, they don't know what you're talking about anymore. They think it's fanaticism when these are the historic teachings of God's church. And we say, oh, that's too hard. Where did this come from? Because we have married and we're speaking half in the speech of Ashdod. We don't know what we believe anymore. And let me tell you one of the greatest things that affects these men. That is when we start studying the books from infidel authors. When we start calling people scholars who can't even count what day is the seventh day of the week. And we say, oh, they're scholars, but they don't believe the Word of God. They believe in their own ways. And we start listening and reading, and what we're really doing is drinking what the Bible calls wine of Babylon. And you think that you could siphon through the wine because some of it isn't too strong. But before you know it, you become intoxicated and you become a bartender thinking you're preaching the truth when you're preaching error in God's remnant church. And we become so absorbed with error that we don't even know the truth anymore. This is what happened in the days of Noah. They started mixed marriage. And all of a sudden, they didn't know the principles of God anymore. They started rejecting the principles of God. And it came to the point where God said to Noah, and it was a hard thing. God said, Noah, my spirit's not always going to be with flesh. I want you to build an ark. I want you to go and build an ark, and every time you slam a nail in that wood, I want you to preach that it's going to rain. Now, people are going to look at you like you're crazy because it never rained before, Noah, but here it is. I need you to do this for 120 years. I'm going to do something. I'm going to cause you to preach, and I'm going to cause you to warn, and I'm going to cause you to preach, and people aren't going to accept you. They're going to call you a wild fanatic. That's what they called Noah. He was a wild fanatic. Oh, he's too firm. Oh, what he's preaching is too hard. It'd be okay if we were in the closet somewhere while the devil is preaching his message boldly. Why should we be afraid to tell the truth? Why should we be afraid to say this is what the Lord says? And if people don't accept what God says, then let God deal with them, brothers and sisters. I believe we should be loving. I, I believe we should be kind. But we must tell the people the truth or the people are going to turn to us one day and say, you mean you knew this? Amen. You knew about these things and you didn't warn us? And our prophet tells us that the preachers are going to suffer ten times greater for not telling the people, dumb dogs that won't bark. You, don't, you shouldn't try to be popular with man. Be popular with God, brothers and sisters. And here all of a sudden Noah was called to do this grand work. And it wasn't easy for Noah. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. When you get home, you read Genesis chapter 5, verse 30. This will tell you why it wasn't easy for Noah. Noah had brothers. Noah had sisters. And if the times are anything like today, there was very much possible that Noah's mother was alive when the flood came, but she wasn't on board. Said Lamech had sons and daughters after Noah. He had brothers and he had sisters. And this is why, brothers and sisters, you need to ask God to put in your mind the reality of who your real family is. Because some of you won't get on board the ark because mama didn't get on board. How many of Noah's brothers and sisters were convicted by the preaching and wanted to get on, but they said, Mama has taught me from a child. Mama's a godly woman. She's not getting on. It wasn't easy for Noah. Noah, brothers and sisters, had a hard, hard job. Can you imagine preaching the Word and one day God saying, Okay, Noah, get on. That's it. No more preaching. And you know that you have brothers. Don't think that he was not touched by feelings, that he was not human. Of course he loved his siblings, but he loved God more. 
And some of us don't love God as much as we love our children. Some of us love our brothers and sisters more than we love God. Some of us are love our parents more than we love God, and we compromise for them. And here Noah is, God telling him to preach. And it was a hard thing because Noah, he came from a priestly lineage. I mean, he was one of those popular kids in the church. He wasn't just a kid raised up out of nowhere. Everybody knew him. He was from Adam's direct lineage. And he was called not to preach for the organization that existed that day. He was called to preach as an independent preacher because he wouldn't have got a check preaching what he was preaching. And he started, hey, we could try to shift it up all we want, but Noah was on God's payroll because he couldn't be on the system of that day. And don't think that they didn't have churches, brothers and sisters. Oh, yes, they had churches. They would preach about Noah. It would be the biggest sermon of the week to laugh about what this fanatic was talking about and warn people against him. Don't go listen to him. He's out of his mind. He's telling people that they ought to eat a certain way. He's telling people that it's going to rain. And brothers and sisters, there were seven reasons that our prophet gives that, that they did not board that ark. Reason number one, reason number one, and I want to read it to you. It comes from a book called, called uh, Patriots and Prophets. Notice what it says, reason number one, why they didn't get on board. And you're going to see that these reasons are the exact reasons why people aren't getting on board today. Notice what it says, reason number one, many at first appeared to receive the warning. Yet they did not turn to God with true repentance. They were unwilling to renounce their sins. Many at first, when they heard the preaching of Noah, they were convicted. Their hearts were moved, but they started looking at what they would have to give up, and they didn't want to really renounce everything. They were the type of Christian that would start saying things like, you mean to tell me God would cause me to be lost over wearing a little? Amen. You mean to tell me God is, God is so caught up in a day that we worship on? You mean to tell, come on, and it was little, God is caught up in a beat? Come on, what kind? They would rationalize that the little sins that they were doing, but I want to say something right now, there's no such thing as a little sin. The wages of sin, singular, is death, brothers and sisters. The wages of sin, singular, lot, don't turn back. Tell your wife not to look back. And when she went to look back, she turned into a pillar of salt, brothers and sisters. You think God is not serious? They were unwilling to renounce their sin. Reason number two, notice what it says. Some were deeply convicted. I mean, deeply moved and would have heeded the words of warning, but there were so many to jest and ridicule that they partook of the same spirit and resisted the invitations of mercy and were soon among the boldest of the scoffers. In other words, they were deeply, deeply convicted, and their hearts were moved to get on, but they were afraid of what people would say. People would ridicule them. They would talk about them, and they wanted to be liked. So rather than joining God, they would kind of laugh at all. You know how someone comes to you? And you know someone is living right for God, but they're strange because everybody else isn't. But you know this person is living for God. And somebody comes to you and they, they tell a joke on him, and rather than you firmly saying, you know what, we ought to be careful because that person is serious about God and we should pray for him, we kind of kind of take the same spirit and laugh because we're ashamed. We're ashamed of ridicule. And then we take on the same spirit, brothers and sisters, and that's what they did. When people would ridicule Noah, they, would, they, they, they were ashamed to stand up and say, wait a minute, my heart burned when Noah preached. That was not the spirit of the devil. That was the spirit of God when Noah preached. And they took on the same spirit. And notice what it goes on to say about those people. For none are so reckless and go to such lengths in sin as do those who have once had life but have resisted the convicting spirit of God. If you want to find somebody who is deadly, you find somebody who once believed. You go find somebody who was once convicted by the power of God. You go find somebody who used to be on fire, but now all of a sudden they backslidden. They will turn Scripture around and mix it up to convince you that they were actually being deceived. I have seen people change their whole lives. I have seen families change, children change, and I've gone back a couple of years later and they're the most boldest people against what they once believed because they were afraid of people ridiculing them. Reason number three, they got caught up in believing that God was too loving. You ever hear that today? Oh, we serve a loving, God's character. God loves us so much. That's contrary to the character of God to destroy this world. Look at all the beauty in this world. God loves us. And look at Noah building that big old massive ark. God would never destroy us. Brothers and sisters, let me tell you something. God loves you so much that he will destroy you. 
It will be worse for you to live forever in the hands of Satan than to burn temporarily because of your sins. It is not contrary to the character of God. He doesn't want to do it. He gets no joy out of it. The Bible calls it a strange act, but God will do it. Don't you ever believe that God is so loving? Oh, he just would never do it. That's what people want to believe. But remember, the law and justice, they're equal. They balance the scale. God loves truth as much as he loves people. And he is not going to alter truth for anybody. He can't do it, brothers and sisters. Have you ever looked and noticed what his son went through? You're talking about love. What manner of love? What did God do for us? You should every day contemplate what sin costs, and then you wouldn't rationalize in your mind what God wouldn't do. But they said, oh, God is too loving. And then the next reason was, <clears throat> they said, look at nature. Nature will not allow this to take place. They got caught up in believing that nature was more powerful than the God of nature. And you have to understand, it had never rained. It's not like us when we say that the earth is going to be consumed with a ball of fire. We can somehow see it because we've seen fire. We felt fire. We know what the destructive power of fire. But they had never seen rain. They had never seen it before. And you have to understand, they're looking at this big, massive piece of boat going up. And these are intelligent people. These weren't cavemen walking around looking at the boat, and I didn't know they had carnival cruise ships. Can you imagine if you live for 900 years how beautiful you can build a boat? If you live for 900 years how you could perfect your talent? These were wise people. They, they weren't ignorant at all, and that's why that boat looks so odd. You think about, think, think about it, Sister E.T., how, how you would play. 900 years, you're playing the piano. 900 years! 900 years, how good would you be? You'd be backwards with your toes, and that piano would be glorifying God with your elbows. 900 years, and we want to make them think that they were ignorant. No, brothers and sisters. And by the way, while I'm on that note, did you know that Noah's boys were 100 years old when they got on board the ark, which means no one got on board the ark except two adults and six children. Because man lived to be 900. So at 100 years old, he was a youth. So we always say, no youth were saved in the flood. The majority were youth that were saved. At 100 years old back then, they were stepping out going to the youth Bible study. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, I want to tell you something. God is not bound by nature. Nature is bound by the God of heaven. I have seen with my own eyes tornadoes coming and the hand of God stop it. I was in Huntsville, Alabama one time, and I was in my car riding. All of a sudden on the radio, it said, anyone in cars, pull over. Get out. Find shelter. A tornado is coming. And all of a sudden, I started to pull over, and I heard the voice of God say, you put your foot on that pedal and keep going. And I said, uh-oh, is this guy? And I put my foot on that pedal. And I started heading up that street. Memorial Parkway was the name. And I kept going, Lord said, do not stop. Do not stop. And I could see everything becoming so black. It got to the point where I couldn't see anything, anything at all, as I went forward because it was blinding me. But the Lord said, keep going, keep going. When I got home, I found my wife and my children and my neighbors all in my house. It's funny what house they go to, huh? Amen. Oh, he's a fanatic. He preaches crazy. But when that tornado started hitting, my neighbors were in there all in the hall. Oh, boy, it's funny what they'll do. Amen. Amen. And when I looked on the news that night, the whole area was wiped out where I was driving. If I would have pulled over, I would have been dead. God held that tornado back until his precious little child who is no good. It frustrates me to understand why even now got away from it and got safe. And I walked in and laughed at my wife. What are you guys scared of? But I was scared to death driving that truck. <laughs> Amen. God is not bound, brothers and sisters, by nature. And then finally, notice this fifth reason. They asserted in their minds. They asserted, and this is the reason many of us make the mistake, they asserted in their minds that if what Noah was preaching was true, the men of renown, the wise men, the great men would understand the matter. In other words, they had seminaries of their day. And they said, now wait a minute, God wouldn't choose a man who's uneducated. Certainly our scholars would understand this matter. Certainly they would know whether or not the world was at an end. 
Certainly everybody else should be preaching it. Why isn't some of the big preachers preaching about it? Why is everybody else relaxed? And, and these are God-fearing men. And these theological institutions, they quieted the fears of the people. You don't have to believe Noah. And a lot of people who were convicted and would have got on board, listen to them. Listen to them instead of to God. And they trust the power of the devil because that's who was speaking. And when people start telling you to relax, everything's going to be okay, when God is saying, watch, for your redemption draw up nigh. When God is showing you every element, every sign in the Bible, every sign in the Bible has taken place except two. Every major sign has taken place in the Bible that God has said would take place just before he comes. And I'm going to tell you what those are one night. They said, oh, these wise men would know, and I could imagine they would take them to the biology department, and they would talk to the scientists, and the scientists would reason and show them why this was impossible to take place. We trust to leaders. Don't trust me, brothers and sisters. Put your trust in God. I can preach with the power of God every single night and one day decide to turn on God and become filled with demonic forces and come the next night. And you've been trusting me all this time and I could speak air to you who are anointed with power from Satan. Don't trust man. You can't put your trust in me. You must put your trust in God. Don't put your trust in any man. Put it in God, brothers and sisters. Man lied. And even today, men are lying. Seminaries around the world don't even believe that the Bible is really true anymore. You'd be surprised how many seminaries teach that the Bible isn't true anymore. You'd be surprised how many people teach that Satan is more powerful than, the, than, than Jesus. They tell you, you can't live victorious. Satan is more powerful than Jesus. And finally, brothers and sisters, the sixth reason was, and this you see today. You see this clear today. It says, as the time of their probation was closing, the antediluvians gave themselves up to exciting amusements and festivities. Those who possessed influence and power were bent on keeping the minds of the people engrossed with mirth and pleasure, lest they should be impressed by the last solemn warning. They said, let's get the young people to just have a good time. Let's keep everybody excited. Let's get them to jumping around. Let's, let's, let's have a false excitement. And that's what's happening today. We want our kids and we want everything to be a happy time. And we find ourselves engaging in things that take our mind off of God. We find ourselves belittling what the gospel is. And it says this was a people of influence. These weren't the children asking for this. This was the people of influence giving it to them because they didn't believe Noah. So they wanted to keep their minds in another direction because they really could not support what they believed. Have you ever noticed what people normally say when they don't have any Bible evidence? And one of the things that has fascinated me throughout my ministry is how many people have so much to say but never have Bible or spirit of prophecy for it. They say, oh, but I feel and I think. But what are you doing? Nothing. What does your feelings have to do with anything? It's about what thus saith the Lord. It's not about what I feel and what I think, brothers and sisters. And many of us are so caught up in amusement. How many of us, how many of us are so caught up so often in doing things that may not even be sinful in what they are, but the fact that it takes your mind way away from God makes it sinful. And so they were so caught up, brothers and sisters. They didn't want to renounce their sins because they loved the things of this world. They loved the things of this world. Number two, not only did they love the things of this world, they were afraid of what people would say. Are you afraid of what people think about you tonight? Are you living for the thoughts of people? Are you living because you're concerned with, with if you do what God says do? Well, this is what people were, were ashamed. And you could imagine with everybody else going to the church and everybody in the church and you're out there on the side on a hill while somebody's putting a hammer up as an object lesson where somebody sells their house. Someone else sells their furniture. They sold everything they had. They gave up everything in order to get on board that ark. Everything. And so what does Christ say to us today? He says in Matthew 24, but as the days of Noah were, so shall also 
It be as the coming of the son, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. In other words, the same thing that took place in Noah's day is going to take place in our day. But we don't have to get on board an ark. We don't have to walk up and get on board an ark filled with animals. What we have to do is get on board the true ark, which is in the Christ, in the heart of Christ. We have to open up and get in the protective power of what Christ has done for us. So God is saying, come to me, my child. Enter into my victory, and I'll protect you from the deluded people on the outside who will rage against you. But many of us don't want to give up certain things, so we don't want to really be in the ark of safety or in Christ. Noah could have built that ark as skillful as man had capabilities to do, but it cannot hang on. When the storm started coming, and a storm is about to hit this world, a storm is about to hit this earth, and you're not going to be concerned anymore about a paycheck. You're not going to be concerned with these little frivolous things that keep you from serving God. You're not going to be concerned with the things of earth. Can you imagine, brothers and sisters, on that day that all of a sudden Noah was told to get in that ark? He was told to get inside. Tell your family to get inside. And they got inside the ark, and an angel came and shut the door of the ark. And now for seven days they waited. When the angel first came, the people were stirred. But because nothing happened, they started joking and jesting and laughing. That's what they're going to do with you. You don't let your children do this? Oh, come on, they're kids. Let them do it. And you're protecting your children. And I don't mean raising fanatics. I believe children should have fun, and they should be happy kids. But I don't believe we should make them and teach them the things of the world to do so. And all of a sudden, the seventh day comes. The seventh day comes and churches are full. And everybody's talking about don't follow fanatics. Every sermon is about how you see Noah stuck in that boat and nothing's happening. Don't fall. And people had a good time. And the Bible says the eighth day. That was when the sun set on that seventh day. And just before the sun set, I could imagine the people talking, oh, girl, I'm going to run to the mall. Somebody else talking about what type of social they were going to have that night. Everybody thought that the next day would be a regular day. But when they looked up, brothers and sisters, and they saw for the first time dark clouds coming in the sky, and when they saw all of a sudden, those clouds come together with a roar that man had never heard, human ears had never understood. This really happened, brothers and sisters. This isn't a fairy tale. When buckets of water started coming down, and, and, and buckets of water and fountains of water started coming from with up, and all of a sudden, they didn't die in one day. The first day, maybe no one lost their life. But as the days kept going on, and they started evacuating cities and taking people to higher grounds. People started dying. And people started screaming. And people started saying, wow, what is it? Could Noah have been telling the truth? Could Noah actually have been true? Did Noah really know what he was talking about? Oh, please, Noah, please. And the seventh reason why they didn't get on board is because it was too late. It was too late to get on board. But they wanted to, brothers and sisters. Can you imagine grabbing your baby? Can you imagine holding on tight and the waters raging and the winds blowing and trees falling and you're screaming and at every scream you give, you're reminded of the sermon when Noah with tears in his voice would say, please get on board. Please be careful. Change your ways. Jesus is about to rain water on this earth. Oh, now what did they think? about ridicule. What did they think about renouncing sin? Nothing on this earth mattered anymore, brothers and sisters. Nothing but life. And it was too late. And you want me to tell you the most horrible thing about the flood? The most horrible thing about the flood, they have to resurrect to burn. Die in a flood. Drowning is a horrible death, but resurrect to burn. Your life was in vain. It would have been better if you weren't born. And God begged 120 years. God pleaded, surrender your hearts to me. Surrender your lives to me. And some of us, we don't believe this earth is going to be destroyed. We don't believe that plagues are one day going to fall. We don't believe that calamities are one day going to hit. We keep trifling with God. And God is saying, my son, give me your heart. Give me your heart. 
This earth is going to pass away. I need you to make a decided effort tonight to say, Lord, I surrender. I surrender all, dear God of heaven. And the minute you surrender, Jesus accepts you. And the minute he accepts you, he gives you complete victory. And when the devil comes to you with those thoughts, brothers and sisters, when he comes to you and says, listen, you know you want this, you need to respond to God and say, no, Lord, I've given my heart to you. Those are my thoughts. That's not what I want. And God will make the devil flee if you would wrestle with self. But too often we say, I don't want to give that one thing up. And like Adam, with nothing pulling us anymore, when Christ gives you victory and there's nothing to pull you anymore and you make a decision to do it anyway, you're just like Adam. There was nothing in Adam that pulled him toward when you give your heart fully to God, God subdues the flesh. He doesn't allow the flesh to have any authority, brothers and sisters. You are free from bondage unless you believe the lie that the devil tells you when he comes and speaks and says, listen, you know you want this. But he doesn't say it like that, does he? He says, I want this. He speaks in the first person, and we buy his voice. And we should run to the cross, brothers and sisters. A new man in Christ doesn't want that anymore. Oh, yes, this world is about to be destroyed. This earth is soon to pass away. Are you ready for Jesus to come, brothers and sisters? Are you ready or will you, like the antediluvians, find yourself when it's too late screaming and babing God, Oh, Lord, didn't I, didn't I, didn't I? Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before thee asking for forgiveness Please, dear God, we have delayed and we have waited and we have waited and waited and waited. And now, when it's almost too late, you're crying to the world even now to please get on board. Get on board. Get on board, little children. Get on board. Please, my children. God is begging us to get on board, brothers and sisters. If you delay, your family could be lost. We can't afford to delay. If you delay, you don't know what will happen as a response. If Lot would have moved when the angel said move, everything would have been all right. It's time to move, brothers and sisters. Lord, show me what's in my life. What's stopping me from moving? What is in my life right now that's stopping me from doing what God has asked me to do. What is it, Lord? What am I caught up in? Oh, yes, brothers and sisters. Yes, yes. The only difference, it's going to be more than six people that are in the ark of safety when the destruction comes next time. God's going to have some people that would rather die than sin. But if you can't run with the footmen, brothers and sisters, you'll never run with the horses. If you're murmuring and complaining and, and you're looking to man for your strength and you're caught up in what man can do for you and you're worried about what people would think of you and you're worried about, if you are worried about what man would think, you might as well worship man. God says, I want to free you tonight. I want you to love me more than you love your children, more than you love your husband, more than you love your mother, more than you love your father. Oh, Noah, how did his heart tear when he heard the water thumping upon the ark and he thought of his mother who didn't get on. He thought of his brothers and sisters who didn't get on, nieces and nephews, preachers who preached to him, and little children who didn't get on. He loved them, brothers and sisters. It took love to give up everything and slam those nails into that gopher wood. It took love to be ridiculed and keep preaching. It took love, brothers and sisters. He loved them. But love cannot force you. And your unbelief, their unbelief did not stop the rain from coming down. Their unbelief didn't do anything about the rain because they felt he was a fanatic. Oh, no, their reasoning didn't help at all at that time. It was too late. And tonight it could be too late for you. I don't know, you may have plenty of time, but I guarantee the majority of us better move now. Jesus is about to come. Are you ready for Jesus to come? Do you want to surrender your heart afresh, anew tonight? Somebody want, may want to say tonight, I want to give my heart to you for the first time. For the first time, I want to give my heart to you. Others may say, Lord, I had your covering, but I step out. And I'm tired of stepping out. I want to get in you, Lord. I want to get in the ark. You're my ark of safety. Your arms are out. Your arms are out. They're open. Jesus is calling. 
Who wants to be in the arms of Christ right now? If it's your desire to be in the arms of Christ right now, I'm going to invite you to just stand to your feet and come and have special prayer with me. Let's move, brothers and sisters. Let's don't make God wait any longer. Those in churches, come to the altar right now. We want to pray for you. We want to pray for you because Jesus has the power to keep you. You must give your heart afresh. Somebody else may want to come and say, listen, I want to bring my son by faith to the altar, Lord. I want to carry my children to the altar tonight. I want my families to be saved. I want to stand in the gap for them, dear God of heaven. I know that probation is closing on this earth. This night, young people, give your heart to God. Let God have it. He'll take care of everything. He'll take care of all your needs. Let's press in together. Let's press in. Let's press in. Let's press in. Our Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you. Oh, Lord, we need help tonight because our unbelief is stronger than our faith. And it's because that's where we have exercised the most. And tonight we're asking for a living faith the faith that resurrected from the grave, the faith of Jesus. Our faith is not good enough. Give us your faith, dear God. Take our hearts, take our lives. Please, Heavenly Father, let this night mark a night where Satan will never have authority or power in our lives. We claim our children tonight. We claim our neighbors. We claim those who our eyes will set on tomorrow. Give us an influence that will draw people to the cross. And Lord, above all things, keep your promise to finish what you have started in our lives. In Jesus' holy name we pray, amen, amen. Tomorrow, brothers and sisters, we're having a special anointing service. And I want you to really be prayer. For those who can fast from something, please, you ask God what it will be and you fast. And if you've been bound by something and, and you want us to join in prayer for you to be free, you come. If, if you're ill, you come. God has many ways of working many things. So let's pray for each other and let's come tomorrow night believing that God is going to do something special. The healing that's most important is spiritual, brothers and sisters. It's spiritual. But God wants us to be in health also. Above all things, that's his promise. So please, let's play. Let's pray for tomorrow night. And let's pray tonight for each other. Let's pray that we'll be free, that we stay free. Tonight we're free, and many of us don't understand what that means. Ask God to tell you as you go home tonight. Ask the Lord to show you, to give you that personal understanding of what it's like. May God be with you. Please remember to pray for me. I'll be praying for you. God bless you, and I'll see you tomorrow night.